Hello friends, uh, in this lecture we will introduce several important objects uh, that are called statistics and their sampling distributions. Uh, they are going to be widely used throughout the course of mathematical statistics and throughout the subsequent courses of econometrics. Therefore, it would be very nice if you carefully go through this lecture and try to understand everything. So, a short reminder. We started this course uh, by posing the typical statistical problem to estimate the unknown population parameter of a probability distribution for some random variable of interest, whether it is a stock return, car accident loss, corporate profitability, or something else. Uh, in order to do this, we collect a random sample and uh, with the capital letters we denote the random variables, so the outcome from the first row in a sample, second row, third row, which is unknown for me in advance, so therefore it is a random variable. Then after collecting these numbers, they are just realizations and I uh, denote them with the small letters small x1, small x2, and so on, and we calculate some function denoted by the capital T, and we call this a statistic. So a statistic is a random variable, because it is based on the random draws, and we want to know its probability distribution, which is called a sampling distribution. There are many statistics introduced in practice, and today we will get familiar with several of them. So in lectures one and lecture two, we used one particular example of a statistic, which is called a sample mean. So a sample mean is based on a random sample, therefore it is a statistic and it has some sampling distribution. And we try to introduce the sampling distribution with the help of weak law of large numbers, with the help of central limit theorem, we introduced uh, what is called large sample distribution of a sample mean, and we've got the following properties. The expectation of this random variable sample mean denoted as mu, with expected value of x bar, sorry, uh, coincides with the expected value of uh, the underlying random variable, and variance of a sample mean shrinks with the sample size and equals to the variance of underlying variable divided by n. Uh, from this, we can see that if n goes to infinity, so the x bar, expectation of x bar uh, becomes closer, x bar becomes closer and closer to the uh, true population mean, because variance shrinks, uh, but still the following fraction, which is the standardized var uh, variable, converges in distribution to the standard normal distribution. This is the result of the central limit theorem. So now, today, today we introduce several other statistics and their sampling distributions that prove to be useful in solving different statistical problems. In the first part, we will base all the derivations on an assumption that the underlying random variable has a normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma squared. Uh, this is very strict assumption, and uh, in many cases in practice, this assumption doesn't hold. And I will talk later about possible uh, ways how you can solve this issue. Uh, in particular, in the second time of the lecture, in the second part of the lecture, we will use the results from the asymptotics to relax this assumption when it's possible. Okay, so first, uh, this is the short reminder on the probability course, uh, because 
before starting the discussion of sampling distributions, we really need to clearly understand uh, what are the objects that we are working with. So first of all, we need to remember what is the cumulative distribution function. Cumulative distribution function uh, specifies the probability that your random variable takes value less than or equal to a given number, small x. Small x is a particular number, is an argument of this CDF, cumulative distribution function. This cumulative distribution function must be defined for all real numbers. Basically, we must be able to plug any number here, minus 1 million, 3, pi, 0, whatever, and answer the question, what is the probability that your random variable is less than or equal to a given number. Uh, for a continuous random variables, we also defined something which is called the probability density function, and this density function has a link with the cumulative distribution function, which is so shown on the screen. When I integrate density function from minus infinity to a small x, then I get exactly my cumulative distribution function, which means that basically a cumulative distribution function is sum of probabilities that x, capital X, takes values from minus infinity to small x because integral is an analog of infinite sum. We also must remember that for any random variable, whether discrete or continuous, the following relations hold. Um, probability that your random variable takes values strictly greater than, strictly greater than small a and uh, weakly less than small b equals to first of all the difference between probability that x is weakly less than b minus probability that x is weakly less than a look this probability includes a case when x equals to a therefore when i subtract it from the previous term I get exactly the condition that x is strictly greater than a. So I exclude this probability from this point. If we are talking about discrete random variables, this is crucial. If we are talking about continuous random variables, this is not that important. So whether you have strict inequality, weak inequality, does not matter. Only for continuous variables. For discrete, you must be careful. And then, using the first part of this slide, we remember that this probability and this probability are defined with the help of cumulative distribution functions evaluated at B and A respectively. We need these expressions in order to work with sampling probabilities as well. One additional uh, piece of knowledge that we need to remember from probability course is a standardized random variable. Uh, if we have any random variable x, it doesn't matter what is the distribution of x, and this random variable has mean, mu, and variance sigma squared, and then we define another variable z, which is the fraction of x minus mu divided by sigma by the standard deviation, then this variable z is also a random variable with a mean 0 and variance 1. We proved this result in uh, the probability course, lecture number uh, 8 must be. So we will have a link uh, somewhere there. Uh, in particular, if x is normally distributed, then z is said to have a standard normal probability distribution with the same properties, mean 0 and variance 1. So the relationship between z and x is either through this fraction or you can also express x in terms of z. You simply multiply z by sigma and add back mu. Then you will get x. When we talk about standard normal probability distribution, we denote PDF of a standard normal as a small phi, Greek phi. And if we 
uh, denotes CDF of a standard normal distribution, we usually use this capital Phi, so, which is the counterpart of Latin F uh, in Greek alphabet. The last thing that we must remember from the probability course, uh, or maybe not the last one, so first of all we need to clearly understand how to interpret the uh, expressions discussed here uh, graphically, because graphical interpretation usually gives us a very simple understanding of the things that are going on. So suppose we have this, and this is the density function of a standard normal distribution. And then I want to calculate the probability that this standard normal distributed random variable is less than or equal to minus 196. Graphically, this probability is defined as the area under the curve of a standard normal density here. Suppose I want to calculate the probability that my random variable must be z, not x, is greater than or equal to 0.84. In this case, this is going to be the right side of this area. Uh, so I take 0.84 on the x-axis and then all the area to the right from 0.84 under the density curve. Uh, gives me exactly this probability. Finally, if I want to calculate the probability that my random variable is bounded between two numbers, for example, minus 0 0.85 and 0, minus 55 and 0 0.84, uh, then the area bounded between these two numbers under the density curve exactly shows me this probability. So the geometric interpretation of this probability is the area under the density curve. And if you look at the slide here, that's exactly what we have here because the integral defines the area under the curve of the integrated function of the integrands. So since we have density curve, which is the curve of the graph of the density function, once I integrate this function, I get exactly the probability. And now the last part from the remainder uh, is the quantile. What is the quantile? If you have a random variable x, and then we take any number p between 0 and 1, then we can call the following x tilde p, the pth quantile of this random variable x, if this value x tilde p being an argument of CDF gives me exactly probability p. Or if I set some probability p, then I want to identify such a number x tilde p that gives me exactly this probability. This is called a quantile, inverse function of a CDF. Graphically, if we are working with the density curve, then quantile is exactly the number on the x-axis that cuts uh, a given area under the curve. For example, I want to identify such value of z tilde, which gives me a probability of 0 0.7. Then it means that the area under the curve from minus infinity to a given number must be 0 0.7, and I calculate this given number, which is 0 0.52. If we are working with the graph of cumulative distribution function, then this graph looks like S-curve, which starts from 0 and always finishes at 1 on the vertical axis. Uh, then I need to identify on the vertical axis a given probability, 0 
and then I need to find the corresponding value of x here, which is 0 0.52. That's the way how quantile is defined. Now, when we remember these necessary results from a probability course, we can move on to the sampling distributions. And the first sampling distribution is a normal distribution, and uh, we have the following uh, definition. If I collect a random sample of n random variables from a normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma squared, then Sample mean, defined as usual, has also a normal distribution with mean that coincides with the mean of, with the common mean of all these random variables in my sample, and variance, which is sigma squared over n, where sigma squared is the variance of every, of each of these variables in my random sample. So this is familiar result, and this result that the sample mean is normally distributed is based on the idea that we draw our sample from a normal distribution. So please uh, understand the difference that uh, while the sample is derived from the unknown distribution, the sample mean has a normal distribution only under the uh, condition that our sample is large, asymptotically large. In this result, we do not need this uh, large sample because initially we assume that the random variables in the sample come from a normal distribution. Then we can transform, uh, we can define the sample statistic Z and uh, this z, if you remember, is defined as the random variable minus its mean divided by its standard deviation. So what is the mean of sample average? So the mean of a sample average is just mu. It coincides with the mean of a random variable of interest. And the standard deviation of a sample mean is this is the square root of sigma squared over n, which is here. If I move the square root of n to the numerator, I can get also this result. So these three uh, fractions are identical. And uh, as we know, this standardized random variable, as soon as x has a normal distribution, must have a standard normal distribution. If you want to calculate for this statistic the value of CDF, which means the probability that my sample statistic is less than something, then in Python we can use the following formula and you will find the separately the tutorial on these uh, Python functions. And why, uh, whenever I want to calculate the quantile of this distribution, I can use the following function in Python. Now let's have a look at the example, how this works. Um, we will start with a highly uh, theoretical example, and then we will uh, relax the assumptions of this example step by step in order to make this closer to the real life. So first of all, we assume that a random variable of interest is the loss in a car accident. We assume that it has a normal distribution. We assume that by some magical chance, we know its population mean, which is 0 0.5 thousand USD, and we know the variance, which is 0 0.3. So remember that variance is the square of a variable, therefore we cannot measure this in 1000 USD, it's something like 1000 USD squared. Um, now, we randomly select a sample of 9 car accidents on a given day from the police reports and evaluate the losses for each. 
So we have nine numbers that represent a random sample drawn from a population of a larger population of all um, car accidents happened on a given day. We want to find the probability that we will obtain the sample mean less than 0.4 thousand USD. So the population mean is 0.5, but because we randomly select nine reports, we can randomly get the result of a sample mean, which is 0.4 or maybe 0.6 or maybe 0.2. It depends on what we will get in the random sample. How likely is this? To obtain something which is zero, which is less than zero point four. So, uh, how we proceed with this example? First of all, given that we know that the each draw of our random sample must have a normal distribution with the following parameters, we believe that the random variable which is called a sample mean, must also have a normal sampling distribution with the same mean 0 0.5, but variance must be sigma squared divided by n, by the sample size. This is the variance of a sample mean. What do we want to find? We want to find this probability that x bar sample mean is going to be less than or equal to 0 0.4. How should we find this probability? So every time that we are seeing such a problem to find the probability that some sample statistic or some estimator is less than or greater than some number, we must transform this sample statistic into a statistic with the known distribution. In our case, we know that x bar somehow is connected to z, and z has a standard normal distribution. So therefore, we need to make some transformations here inside this parenthesis in order to obtain a statistic with a known distribution, in our case z. So let's go. First step. I subtract from both sides population mean mu and i know that this is minus uh, this is 0 0.5 and i must divide by the square root of variance divided by n here so this is the square root of 0 0.3 divided by n on the left hand side and now i just rewrote re this in order to make it visible. On the left hand side, once I take the square root of sigma squared, I get z, z statistic. On the right hand side, I have minus 0 0.5477. Right now, I just need to calculate this probability. And this probability might be calculated with the help of Python function shown on the previous slide. Or you can use any other statistical software or even Excel in order to find this probability. You must be familiar with calculation of these probabilities from the previous course. So this probability is 0 0.29. What does this mean? So here is an explanation and you will see the demonstration how to calculate these probabilities later. So what does this mean? It means that uh, probability of getting the sample mean, which is less than 0 0.4, under the following conditions, if I know that the population mean is 0 0.5 and variance is 0 0.3, so when I randomly select a sample of nine police reports uh, with probability 29%, I will obtain sample mean, which is less than 0 0.4. Okay, quite large probability to obtain very low sample average which suggests that once you calculate a sample average from nine police reports you must be aware that this number can be far away from the true population mean you see that the true population mean is 0 0.5 but it is highly likely to obtain 
a sample mean less than 0 0.4, far away from this. Why? Because we have random variable, and this random variable has some variance, so therefore in your sample you must receive different numbers. So here is a graphical representation of the previous example. So all this area represents you the probability that the sample mean is going to be less than or equal to 0 0.4, which is identical or equivalent to the probability that the standard, standardized variable z is less than or equal to minus 0 0.5473. Now, let's move one step ahead. Uh, let's assume that we do not know a population mean, but we for some reason still know the population variance sigma squared, which is 0 0.3. So assume that we randomly select nine car accidents on a given day from the police reports and evaluate the losses for each, but now we want to know what is the probability that the calculated sample mean will deviate from the unknown population mean by no more than 0 0.2000 USD. So I don't know what is the population mean, but I want to know what is the probability that my result of the calculation will deviate from my target unknown population mean by no more than 0 0.2000 USD. How should we deal with this problem? So first of all, we need to write down formally what we want to find. Probability that x bar minus mu will deviate from 0 0.2 is represented here. It's just an absolute value of this difference because it will it may deviate to the left, it may deviate to the right, but no more than 0 0.2. As before, we need to transform the expression in parentheses in order to obtain a familiar statistic. In our case, z statistic. So first of all, let's get rid of this absolute value here. So my deviation must not be less than minus 0 0.2 and must not be greater than 0 0.2. So the next step is familiar from the first example. We just subtract, uh, sorry, we don't need to subtract the population mean because it's already given, but we need to divide by variance divided by n square root of variance divided by n, here and here. So now, in the middle, I have z statistic, my random variable, and on the left and right hand side, I have the symmetric values minus 0, 1, 0, 0.95 and 1.095. So this might be evaluated with the help of the reminder that we had several slides ago, so I need to rewrite this in the following way. So look, here we are talking about the continuous random variable, therefore this weak inequality does not matter. It doesn't matter for me whether I have weak or strict inequality, once again it matters only for the dis uh, discrete random variables, be careful with them. So this is one probability, this is the other probability, we know how to calculate these probabilities, finally I have 0 0.62 Seven two six seven. Well, these two probabilities are calculated with the help of the same Python function, stats norm CDF. And here is an illustration. Uh, well, basically, mm, the probability that my sample average or sample mean will deviate from the population mean by no more than zero point two uh, is represented by the following area, and I know that this area is equal to approximately 73%. So 70%, 73% chances, chances that the result of my calculation based on sample will not deviate from the population mean by 0 0.2, by more than 0 0.2. And the third example, in order to uh, be familiar with all possible uses of uh, statistics is the following. Based on the same setup, we want to calculate the maximum deviation of a sample mean from the true population mean 
that will occur with probability 0.9 if we randomly select 15 car accidents. So now we have the reverse problem. I set a given probability 0.9 and I want to know what is the maximum possible deviation that will occur with the following probability. So formally, it must look like this. I want to find such number A here that my deviation will not exceed with probability 0.9. Then, until some point, I can do a familiar steps. First of all, I get rid of this absolute value with the help of this double inequality. Then I divide everything by square root of sigma squared over n here. And now I will change the variables. So in the middle I have z. Uh, the left boundary I denote as minus b and the right boundary I denote as b because you see that they are just symmetric around zero with minus sign. And this probability must be equal to 0 0.9. And I'm looking for the values b and minus b such that this probability is 0 0.9. So just not to forget that b equals to the following expression. So now let's observe the graphical representation of this problem. So we have a density function of a standard normal distribution. And we know that we want to have a symmetric area around zero bounded by two numbers minus b and b and this area must be equal to 0 0.9. So this red area is given to me. I don't know what are these numbers b and minus b. I know that to the left from minus b this area or probability that z is less than or equal to minus b is equal to 5% and to the right of this area it's also 5%. Why? First of all, because the whole area under this curve must be 1, the full probability. Uh, and if this red area is 0 0.9, so the rest is 10%, 0 0.1. And this 0 0.1 must be equally divided between the left part and the right part, left area and right area. Therefore, I have 5% to the left of the red area and 5% to the right of the red area. Now, let's remember that what is minus b? Minus b is such number that cuts me an area under the density function from minus infinity to minus b. And I know that this area is exactly 0 0.05 or 5 hundredth. B gives me probability that z is from minus infinity to b and this probability is 95%. This 5 plus this 90%. So therefore, I know that minus b is the 5% quantile of a standard normal distribution and b is 95% quantile of a standard normal distribution. But since they are symmetric, I just can use this fact that minus b is a is a five percent quantile okay so what it gives me i know that probability that z is less than or equal to minus b is five percent from the picture and therefore i am able to calculate this minus b minus b is minus 1.645 with the help of the python function pbf this is a quantile so z is less than or equal to minus 1645 with probability 5%. Now from here b is the positive value 1645 and then I remember that b was defined like this and if I multiply b by this square root I will get a exactly what we have here 1645 multiplied by the square root and this is 0 0.23. So what is re this result? If I draw a sample of 15 car accidents, 
the sample mean will not deviate from the population mean, which I don't know. I don't know what is the population mean. I don't know what is my target, but I don't know. I know that the possible deviation of my calculations based on the sample of 15 cars will not exceed 0 0.23 with probability 90%. So I know how precise I can, in advance, calculate how precise can be my calculation. In 90% of cases, the calculated sample average will not deviate from my target, unknown target, by more than 0 0.23. So now, we still believe that a population variance is known. In practice, of course, we do not know neither population mean nor population variance. Therefore, a sample variance also must be somehow evaluated in terms of precision and in terms of its sampling distribution. Before moving to this question, we need to introduce a new sampling distribution which is called the chi-square distribution um, suppose we have n draws in a random sample from a normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma squared define a standardized value z which is x minus mu divided by sigma for every random draw from population those are standard normal variables now define the following variable this is the sum of squares of these standardized values and if i put instead of z the initial expression for z i will get the following thing and then this object this sum has its own known distribution and we call this distribution chi-square this is also a statistic because this is based only on the sample observations x i and two constants mu and sigma it does not have anything beyond the random sample so we call this statistic as uh, a chi-square statistic therefore it has a chi-square distribution and uh, the uh, parameter of this distribution is n degrees of freedom and we usually denote the statistics as chi-squared n why this parameter is the only parameter that identifies chi-square distribution because this sum depends only on the number of terms inside this sum you see that everything here is a standard standardized or standard normal random variable and therefore the only thing that influences this distribution is the number of elements one two three four five and so on in order to work with this distribution we also have two python functions they have similar syntax as for the normal distribution but instead of norm here you must have chi squared or chi 2. if you want to evaluate cumulative distribution function then it's cdf if you want to evaluate quantile it's ppf and you must provide two arguments to this function the value of x or the value of probability and the number of degrees of freedom so let's see how the probability density function of a chi-square distribution looks like. Uh, depending on the number of degrees of freedom, this shape is different. For example, if there are two degrees of freedom, we have something like this, hyperbola. If we have five degrees of freedom, we have highly right-skewed distribution. You see that all possible arguments of this distribution start from zero. And this is not surprising. Why? Because z squared might be only a positive number or zero. 
never negative. When the number of degrees of freedom increases, when the number of elements in that sum increases, uh, the distribution becomes closer and closer to symmetric one. So first of all, it moves, the center of the distribution moves to the right, and it becomes more look like a symmetric one. And then asymptotically, it goes to the normal distribution as well. So this is about densities. Uh, when we work with probabilities, the logic is the same. If I want to calculate, for example, what is the probability that this chi-square statistics is less than or equal to 0 0.58, I just calculate the area under this curve from, my, from 0 to the given number. And this is, for example, 0 0.1, 10%. Or I can say that 0, 0.58 is the 10% quantile of a chi-square distribution with three degrees of freedom, which is important to specify always how many degrees of freedom do you have. Or if I want to calculate what is the probability that chi-squared uh, with statistic with 10 degrees of freedom is greater than 13.44, I'm looking for this area to the right of a given number and this number sorry 0.44 is what this is the 80 percent not 20 but 80 percent quantile of a chi-square distribution with 10 degrees of freedom so the logic when you work with probabilities or quantiles is exactly the same as in the standard normal distribution the only difference is that chi-square distribution has a specific shape. How can we use a chi-square distribution when making some conclusions about the population, oh, sorry, about the sample variance distribution? Let's see. If we have a random sample of a size n from a normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma squared, and if we define a sample variance as following, so this is the sum of square deviation of each observation from its sample average squared divided by n minus 1. This is the random variable because it depends on the random sample and it depends on another random variable which is x bar. Now, we define the following fraction n minus 1 times s squared divided by sigma squared sigma squared is a constant it's a population parameter unknown to us well if i plug this expression into the numerator of this fraction what i will get i will get this summation i will get the sum of x i minus x bar squared multiplied by sigma squared now if i take this sigma squared which is the common term. And if I take the sigma squared inside the summation sign and inside the brackets, I will get the following. And look, if I change x bar with mu, I will get a familiar expression. It must not be sigma squared. It's a typo. It must be sigma here. Here it must be sigma. So it must look familiar because it is exactly what we had here. The only difference is that instead of mu, we have x bar. We have a sample variance. Therefore, we say that this statistic has a chi-square distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So 1 degree of freedom is lost because of x bar being a random variable. Well, we know something about the sampling distribution of a sample variance. Now, we know that this is somehow related to the x bar, uh, chi square distribution. Sorry. And also, the result is that x bar and s squared are independent random variables, which is useful for many practical purposes that we will introduce later on. So let's see an example how we can exploit the, the chi-square distribution for our purposes. 
So let's remember the example number two. We assume that the loss in the car accident has a normal distribution with sigma squared, which is 0 0.3 and a known population mean. Now, suppose we select a random sample of 10 car accidents and measure the loss for each accident on a given day. And these observations are used to calculate the sample variance now, not the sample average, but sample variance, which is a random variable. We want to find the probability that the sample variance will exceed 0 0.76. So even though a true population variance is 0 0.3, it is possible to obtain through the random sampling such value of a sample variance that exceeds 0 0.6. And we want to know how likely is this. So we start solving this problem with a similar step as before. We need to formally identify the probability of interest. In our case, we are looking for the probability that x squared exceeds 0 0.6. In order to find this probability, we want to reformulate this in the following way. It's 1 minus probability that x s squared will not exceed 0 0.6. Then, I don't know what is the sampling distribution of s, s squared. I need to transform this expression in order to get something familiar, in order to get some sampling some, some statistic with a known sampling distribution. And you can imagine, you can imagine that this is a chi-square distribution. So how should we do? We know that chi-square distribution is defined as s squared times n minus 1 divided by sigma squared, which we are doing here. n minus 1 times s squared divided by sigma squared. And on the right hand side, I plug the exact values, n minus 1 is 10 minus 1, sigma squared is 0 0.3. On the left hand side I have chi squared statistic with n minus 1 degrees of freedom, which is 9. On the right hand side I have 18. And finally this probability equals 0 0.9648. Remember that we are interested in the probability that s squared exceeds 0 0.6. Therefore, we need to calculate this final result. So first of all, this probability is calculated with the help of Python. And uh, lastly, the probability that a sample variance exceeds 0 0.6 is 1 minus what we have calculated here, and this is 3.5%. So this is very unlikely, but only probability 3.5%. This is very unlikely that the sample variance will exceed two times of a population variance. So assume that you don't know what is the population variance, you will get exactly the same result. You will say that, well, my sample variance will exceed the population variance two times with the given probability. Here is a graph, typical representation of the previous results. Uh, the probability that the sample variance exceeds 0 0.6 is 3.5% and this probability is represented as an area under the uh, chi-square uh, density with 9 degrees of freedom, which is here. Now, let's introduce one additional exercise related to the chi-square distribution. Using the same setup, let's find an interval of values that will include s squared with a probability of 0 0.9. So formally, we want to find such numbers a1 and a2 that the probability of s squared being between them, being bounded between them is 0 0.9. So we start with the transformation in order to obtain, instead of a random variable with an unknown distribution, random variable of 
statistic with the known sampling distribution. And it's here. So in the center, we have chi-square statistic. On the left and right hand side, we have the following expression. So be careful now, because chi-square distribution uh, is not symmetric, which is different to the normal distribution in example number three. Therefore, we must keep these subscripts A1 and A2. They are not symmetric around zero. So now I substitute this left-hand side and right-hand side expressions with B1 and B2. It's given here. And I know that this probability must be 0 0.9. Let's see on the graph what do we have this is very similar to example number three one difference is that we have chi-square distribution instead of standard normal distribution so here we have a given probability 0 0.9 bounded between b1 and b2 to the left of b1 a probability must be 0 0.05 or 5 percent and to the right of b2 we must have exactly the same probability. Therefore, B1 is a 5% quantile of a chi-square distribution, and B2 is a 95% quantile of a chi-square distribution. Here we are. So now, when we identified what are B1 and B2, and when we identified the probabilities, we must be able to calculate them. So using Python function PPF, we calculate that uh, B1 is 3.325 and B2 is 16.919. Now remembering that B1 and B2 substituted some expressions for A1 and A2, we must be able to derive A1 and A2. Just plug in a, B1 and B2 in these expressions, and then we derive that A1 is 0 0.111 thousandths, and A2 is 0 0.564. So what do we have? In the sample of 10 car accidents, the sample variance of a loss will be bounded between this number, 0 0.111, and this number, 0 0.564, with probability 90%. If the population variance equals 0 0.3, of course. So that's another use of a chi-square distribution. We put some prediction how large might be uh, a range of possible values of a sample variance with a given probability, with a probability 90%. If you obtain something outside of these boundaries, well, you are lucky enough because you hit some unlikely outcome, which belongs to the interval outside of 90% probability. For example, if you calculate a sample variance, which is 0 0.05, which is outside of these boundaries, then this is a rare chance because the probability of obtaining this value is outside of 90%. But we will talk about this a bit later. So now we know how to work with unknown population mean, and we know how to work with an unknown population variance. Let's combine these two in order to understand how we can make some conclusions about the distribution of a population mean of a sample mean sorry of a sample mean if the population variance is not known in order to do this we introduce one additional distribution which is called students or t distribution student is the name that uh, Student is the uh, pseudonym that uh, a statistician, uh, William Go uh, Gossen, used 
uh, when he published his paper on this distribution. So basically, it's, it has nothing to do with students. It is just a pseudonym of uh, an author who first published a paper on this type of a distribution. Uh, we can call this T, we can call this student's distribution. These two names are interchangeable. Um, well, how we define this distribution? So let Z be a standard normal random variable. We know what is that. And let W be a chi-square distribution variable with new degrees of freedom. So we know what is that. Now, if we define the following, so first of all, Z and W are independent, if they are independent, and we know that sample mean and sample variance are independent, then the following fraction, T, which is a standard normal variable divided by a square root of a chi-squared random variable with, divided by new degrees of freedom has a student's or t distribution with new degrees of freedom. You must see that this is somehow familiar. On the numerator, we may have a sample mean minus population mean, and this is normally distributed. In the denominator, we may have a sample variance which has some relation to a chi-square distribution. So first of all, let's try to understand how this distribution looks like, and then we will apply this distribution to the sample mean. So the following functions might be used in order to evaluate either probability, cumulative distribution function or quantile of a t-distribution. So always you must use as a parameter degrees of freedom. And uh, here is the density. Uh, here are the densities of student distribution with different degrees of freedom. So on the top with the black line, you may see the standard normal density here. And then the blue line is a student's distribution with two degrees of freedom. Red line is five degrees of freedom, 10. And the violet line is 20 degrees of freedom. You see that a student distribution converges to a standard normal distribution as the number of degrees of freedom increases. But if a sample size is small, because the degrees of freedom depend on a sample size, uh, a student distribution is a fat-tailed distribution. You see that the tails here, the more is the number of degrees of freedom, the tails are uh, less and less, and closer and closer to, this, uh, to the standard normal distribution, but still these tails are fatter than a standard normal distribution. Therefore, if you are looking for some probability that your random variable belongs to the tail of a t-distribution, this probability is going to be greater than the probability that the same random variable depends or the standard normal random variable belongs to the same interval. So we will see this. So please mind this crucial difference between student distribution and the standard normal distribution. Student's distribution is a fat tail distribution, but it converges to the standard norm. So now, how the student distribution is related to the sample mean, a sample average. If we have a random sample of n observations from a normal distribution, with mean, mu, and variance sigma squared. And if we do not know neither population mean nor population variance, we just estimate them with the help of a sample mean here and sample variance here. Then the following fraction, x bar minus mu divided by s over square root of n. So look, 
this has a normal distribution, this has a chi-square distribution, and this has, this is the number of degrees of freedom, nu. It has a t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. The only difference to z is s here sample standard deviation instead of sigma population standard deviation. And you see that whenever I don't know what is sigma or sigma squared, I must use t distribution in order to make some conclusions related to the sample mean. So now let's see what's going to be the difference. Let's go to the example number one. But now we move close to the practical real life. We do not know population mean and we do not know the population variance. We estimate both of them. So suppose that I randomly select n car accidents, a sample of n car accidents, and based on this sample I calculate a sample mean and I calculate the sample variance, which is 0 0.3. It's not a population variance now, it's a sample variance. So my question is, how likely is this to obtain a sample mean, which is less than 0 0.4 thousand USD? So, we want to find the following probability, but the, at this moment the population varies is unknown, so I cannot use the standard normal sampling distribution. So, as before, I transform this expression into something that is familiar to me, and in this case it's going to be t statistic, which has t or student's distribution here x bar minus mu. Okay, so here we assume that mu is still known for some reason, 0 0.5, but so we will relax this assumption slightly later that when we don't know anything. Uh, so, okay, mu is known here, and um, well, here is t statistic. On the left-hand side, it's not z. Be careful, it's not sigma squared. It's a sample variance, s squared. And uh, so now I have the following. So it's a probability that t statistic is less than or equal to minus 0 0.5477. And this probability is 0 0.3. Remember that in the example number one, a probability that we obtained was, it was here, it was 0 0.29 with the same population mean now and with the same population variance. Now, because of a t distribution, this probability is slightly higher. Now, because of a t distribution, this probability is 0 0.3. So therefore, our uncertainty is larger. You see that probability that z is less than 0, minus 0 0.54, is less than probability that t is less than the same number because of an additional uncertainty related to the unknown population variance. And as n goes to infinity, this difference shrinks. We have seen when I increase the number of degrees of freedom, the student distribution converges to the standard normal distribution. So here is a picture, the same picture similar picture to the standard normal distribution, but now it's t distribution and uh, the probability that the sample average is going to be less than 0 0.4 is given with this uh, area. And let's, based on the same example, let's calculate the maximum deviation of a sample mean from the true population mean that will occur with probability 0 0.95 if we randomly select 20 car accidents. So, formally, 
we want to find such number a the probability uh, that the absolute value of x bar minus mu will not exceed this a with probability 0 0.95 so as usual i transform this into the double inequality first then i divide this but now i don't know what is the true population variance therefore i divide this by the square root of it sample variance divided by n here is a sample variance 0 0.3 and here is a sample variance 0 0.3 and then i denote left and right hand side expressions which are symmetric around zero by minus b and b and this probability must be equal to 0 0.95 so let's remember what b denotes and then let's look at the graph. This graph represents exactly the same story as an example three. Uh, the red area is a given area of 0 0.95 and the T statistic is bounded between some number minus B and some number B. To the left of this red area, I have an area which is 2.5%. To the right of this red area, I have another part, which is also 2.5%. So what is minus B? Minus B is 2.5% quantile of a T or student distribution with 19 degrees of freedom. Sample size minus 1. So formally, I can write the following expression. This is a probability that T is less than or equal to minus B equals to 2.5%. And minus B is simply calculated using Python function stats T, PPF, 2.5% and 19 degrees of freedom. So from here, B is a positive value, 2.093. And then remembering what is A, I can simply calculate A, which is 0 0.256. What is this? Um, if I collect a sample of 20 car accidents, and I don't know what is the true population mean, and I don't know what is the true population variance, but I estimated a sample variance, which is 0 0.3, then my sample mean must not deviate from the population mean by more than 0 0.256 thousand USD with probability 95%. So again, I'm 95% sure that the result of my calculation will not deviate from my target from the population mean by more than 256 dollars. And one more sampling distribution that uh, is used in many applications in statistics and econometrics is called F distribution. So in this lecture, we will briefly mention how we can build this distribution. Uh, but later on, uh, I will refer to this lecture when we will uh, see this distribution in the practical applications. So suppose we have two random variables, W1 and W2, and those are independent chi-square distributed random variables with nu1 and nu2 degrees of freedom respectively. Then we define the following statistic, F, W1 divided by nu1 degrees of freedom, W2 divided by nu2 degrees of freedom. So this is something like a variance sample variance one sample variance two so it has an f distribution with new one numerator degrees of freedom and new two denominator degrees of freedom and this distribution is used when we want to compare the variances of two normal populations based on information contained in independent random samples from the two populations so basically, we want to test whether, whether population variances are equal when we know only sample variances. Well, I don't know what is the population variance 
of a first population, what is the population variance of a second population. I can calculate sample variances, and with the help of sample variances, I can conclude whether the whether I believe that true population variances are equivalent. So this ratio, sample variance over population variance divided by another sample variance over another population variance must have an F distribution. And this F distribution has numerator degrees of freedom and denominator degrees of freedom. In Python, similarly to the previous uh, distributions, we have F distribution here also has a CDF, but now we need to provide two degrees of freedom, numerator, denominator, and the same story about the quantile. So regarding the probability density of this F distribution, it depends on both numerator and denominator degrees of freedom. You can see here that this is also right skewed distribution, uh, which can assume only values from zero. To plus infinity uh, and uh, well when we increase the degrees of freedom basically it does not uh, look like the distribution converges to the standard normal you see that this blue line with five degrees of freedom and then this red line with 10 degrees of freedom they almost they are almost similar so here is this simple short example about uh, F distribution. As I said, later on we will have some practical applications of F distribution. So if you take independent samples of size 6 and 10 from two normal populations with equal population variances, we want to find the number B such that this ratio is less than or equal to B. The probability of that is 95%. B is a quantile of F distribution. 95% quantile of F distribution. So first of all, if we believe that two population variances are equal, so then this ratio, sigma 1, sigma 2, are cancelled, and we have S1 over S2 squared. So this ratio must have F distribution. And since I know that this has an F distribution with five numerator and nine denominator degrees of freedom, I can simply calculate the quantile, 95% uh, quantile of F distribution, and this is 3.4817. Therefore, therefore, what we have, basically, what is B? B describes that a sample variance uh, based on the sample drawn from the first population will not exceed another sample variance by more than 3.48, well, 3.5 times with probability 95%. See, Your, the result of the calculation of a sample variance from one sample will not exceed the results of a sample variance from another sample by more than 3.5 times. Okay, now we know four distributions, four sampling distributions, and all of them are quite useful when working with data and when predicting or making some inferences about the population parameters that are not known. Z distribution, T distribution, chi square distribution, and F distribution. Now, what happens if a sample size is large? First of all, throughout the whole first part, we assumed, and be careful that this assumption is really important, that all our sample is drawn from a, no from normal, from a normal distribution. What if not? Can we employ somehow central limit theorem in the same way as we used in the previous lecture and uh, we proved that a sample mean has a standard uh, has a normal distribution in large samples can we employ the clt here well the answer is yes sometimes so first of all let's define the following if 
axes are drawn from a distribution, any distribution. Look, now I don't say anything about stand, about a normal distribution. If this is a random sample from a distribution with mean mu and variance sigma, and mu and sigma are unknown, so the most realistic assumption, right? So when I have some random sample, I don't know the shape of this distribution. I don't know what is the population mean. I don't know what is variance. I know almost nothing about this. Well, sample variance converges in probability to the population variance. So I do not prove this, but if you remember the lecture number two, uh, we introduced several important properties of convergence and distribution. And when you apply these properties, you will be able to prove this relationship very simply. So what it says, it says when I increase a sample size uh, large enough, my sample variance will most likely not deviate by the population variance by a small amount. Using this result, we can prove the following result. The same, if I have a random sample from any distribution with the common mean and common variance, and this mean and variance are not known, then I have a sample mean and sample standard deviation as, okay, so this is the square root of sample variance, then the following fraction, look, this is a T statistic, but if N goes to infinity, this fraction converges in distribution to the normal distribution. So basically this expression and this picture and this picture are about the same. You see, when I increase n, t distribution converges to the standard normal distribution. The same story here. Which means that in large samples, in large samples, instead of t, you can use z distribution. You can believe that s represents exactly the true population variance, but only in large samples when n is large enough. When n is small, when you have 5, 10, 20, 30, 50 observations, better to use t instead of z better to use student distribution. Well, what about other statistics? What about chi-squared and f? So chi-squared distribution and f distribution are both, as, and statistics as well, are both based on the idea that underlying variables are random. Uh, well, unfortunately, uh, Nothing converges to chi squared and f whenever we have other not normally distributed variables. So there are some properties of those chi square and f statistics. What happens to them if a sample size increases? But those are beyond of this course. We will not discuss them. And basically, you must be careful here. Whenever you use chi squared or f distribution, you must first justify that initial variable of interest has a normal distribution or at least can be approximated with the help of normal distribution. Even if the sample size is large, it doesn't help you. Otherwise, we can use just some other approaches which are not covered in this course. And on the last slide, uh, you can find uh, the overall picture of what we have covered in this lecture. So we have statistic formula, how the statistic is distributed in small samples and in large samples. So first is Z statistic. Here is the way how we calculate this Z statistic and Z statistic in small samples already is, is, is distributed as a standard normal variable. In large sample, nothing changes. It's also standard, has a standard normal distribution. T-statistic, 
The only difference with that statistic is here. Instead of population standard deviation, I use S. And in small samples, this T statistic is distributed with uh, S as T distribution, student distribution with N minus one degrees of freedom. When the sample size increases, in large samples, we can approximate a distribution with the standard normal mean. So chi-squared statistic has the following form. It has in small samples chi-squared distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. And in this course, we do not cover how it is distributed in large samples. And finally, f statistic with n1 minus 1 and n2 minus 1 degrees of freedom, which the formula is here. And it has f distribution with the following number of degrees of freedom, and we don't cover what happens to F distribution in large samples. So this is all about sampling distributions. In the next lectures, we will start the discussion about the estimation of unknown population parameters, the method of estimation, the methods of evaluation of uh, how we evaluate those estimators, and how we can use these introduced sampling distributions in order to make some practical conclusions. Um, as an appendix to this video, you may find the tutorial number two, uh, the introduction to Python, where all the examples that we have covered here are going to be explained with the help of Python and how we can use Python to make the calculations. Thanks for your attention and see you next time.